So our last speaker in this session is Richard Bowman from Environment Southland. Richard is the biosecurity manager there. And I was thinking about how long I've known you, Richard, actually, just today. And I've realised it's over 15 years, probably almost 20 years. So um, nice to have you here and welcome. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andrea. I'd like to talk today a bit about a regional council perspective on research and pest management. Now, regional councils, as you probably know, have, have some sort of a role in biodiversity, and we're still working on what that really means. Regional councils, the 16 of us, we're set up, we operate as a, as a level of local government across all New Zealand, and we have statutory roles under the Resource Management Act, Local Government Act, etc. But when it comes to biodiversity, we do have some statutory roles, and they're defined under the Resource Management Act. And in particular, we have to have a regional policy statement which acknowledges um, biodiversity in our region and sets some guidelines and standards for how it's to be done. We also have access to tools through a toolbox we call the Biosecurity Act. The Biosecurity Act doesn't require us to carry out biodiversity management or any kind of pest control, but it enables us. So regional councils have responsibilities over 70% of New Zealand, 19 million hectares, and if you look at the map there, um, you'll see that that shows the percentage of New Zealand's environments that are protected. And as you can see, the red or hot areas which are least protected tend to occur in areas where regional, regional councils have jurisdiction. They are in the lowland populated areas, whereas much of our remote, mountainous, distant country is protected. But that's why those values in those hot areas are so important. Regional councils spend about $20 million a year collectively doing pest management. And much of that is focused on protecting biodiversity. It could be controlling small mammal pests, it could be weed control, it could be site restoration. This has just become part of our business these days. But there's one activity that's really quite important for us, and that is communities. Regional councils have such a lot of things to do Biodiversity tends to get left out a little bit. However, when communities get involved and say, hey, you guys need to help us to do this, regional councils really have to come to the party. So communities have become drivers in a way. And I've just got a, a picture there of an example of one of probably hundreds of community projects all over New Zealand, which are driven by the community, helped by the agencies, by regional councils, Department of Conservation and other people, are trying to protect the things that they value in their backyard. However, these projects very often become never-ending, and we talked about maintenance before the cost of maintenance. It never stops. And I guess you, you tend to get situations where you get project fatigue, and a lot of it just comes down to the fact that the tools that we have just won't take us where we really need to go. So then, what do regional councils need for biodiversity and biosecurity? Well, I've got a wish list there, and I'm not going to go through it, but you see small mammal control sits pretty near the top of the list for me anyway, and I think most regional councils would say the same. But there's a whole host of other things, which are bread and butter things. They're things that we all need, we should have. And again, regional councils tend to be fairly operationally focused because we are at the cold face very often. So, yep, we've got a wish list. Now, who's going to take this wish list and try and turn it into, into some sort of outcome. The Biomanagers, you may be aware, is a, a national collective. It's part of the regional council's special interest groups, which are groups usually around a particular discipline that, have, that work together on aligning policy across the whole of regional councils or with central government, and they look at trying to synergize work programs. So where there's mutual benefit. So that's a really important uh, part of regional councils because it means that regional councils can act collectively, and in some matters, they can actually speak with one voice. So you can see that little red outlined area there. That's where the biomanagers sit. They provide advice directly to the chief executives, and they have two uh, working groups underneath them. So this is the group that's sort of taken up the challenge, if you like. A little bit of historical context here. Most of you will be familiar with the, the massive change that's gone on in the science and research sector in the last 20 odd years with the disbandment of DSIR and the beginnings of Morstan Forst and then MSIs, then MBs. And during this time, 
government tended to lead biodiversity and biosecurity research, particularly regional councils got involved in these sorts of areas here. But here we've got the, the, the precursor of the biomanagers working away over this time, trying to come up with ways to define better tools. I think a really important juncture was when EnviroLink was formed back in about 2005. This actually provided a focus I'll talk about a little bit later on. But in 2012, the Biomanagers was formed out of the Biosecurity Working Group and took on biodiversity as an important focus of, of regional council business. And it, 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 it sort of led to a, a bio biosecurity and biodiversity roadmap, which linked very nicely to the, um, to the, uh, the, the science challenges. And of course, nowadays we have predator-free New Zealand or predator-free 2050, and regional councils are much more involved. So that's a bit of history as to where regional councils have been working for a long time to try and improve their toolbox. So why a roadmap? Well, we've grappled with this whole issue of research needs for decades, really, and a lot of it was terribly ad hoc. It wasn't really until EnviroLink brought us all together and made us start to think strategically about what we needed, what we were going to do with it, how we were going to measure our success, that we came to the view that we had to do better and we had to be more strategic. So we wanted to be able to promote biodiversity and biodiversity research at a national level. We wanted to have a stake in it and we wanted to have a say in it as research users. So back in about 1914, sorry, 2014, um, we decided to produce a roadmap, a strategic roadmap. And that was on the advice of EnviroLink and the Regional Science Advisory Group, and people like Bill Dick had a lot to do with this. And because EnviroLink funding was available, we commissioned a roadmap. Now, a roadmap sounds like a very simple concept. And, and I like to think it's just how do we get from A to B over time? And that, that could be quite a lengthy period of time. And the other thing you have to remember, that landscape that we've got to go across is dynamic, and it's constantly changing and complex. So we really have to manoeuvre our way across this landscape, getting where we need to go, going through those sort of intermediate, um, those intermediate objectives. The other thing about a roadmap is, I've discovered, it's never going to stop. We may have one, but it's always going to change because the environment we, we work in changes. But it also requires ownership, and it needs to have governance. So those are sorts of components, really, uh, of a roadmap. And this is what we got, a lovely report um, put together by, by Landcare Research, who worked through a whole lot of issues for us. And effectively, that's what it contains. There was a strategic scan of the high-level goals. There was a critical review of all the literature, with the workshops. Um, we looked at ways to implement the, the ideas that we were looking at. But ultimately, we came up with a document which gave us a bit of a view into the future and how we might proceed to where we need to go, particularly to those long-term um, high-level outcomes. I think really importantly, we came up with half a dozen, five major goals that we want to pursue in the future. And as you can see, they align very closely to what we're talking about here today in the bioheritage bio um, challenge. Obviously, there's, there's other stuff in there too, but um, at, as opposed to just looking at, at mammalian pests, but those are sorts of things that we figure are going to be really important to us moving through the next couple of decades. And these are the sorts of research areas that we would need to, to promote, to become involved in, to take a stake in, in order to get us to those long-term goals. And as you can see, um, the novel tools and tactics, strategies for weed and pest control, that's one that I think is really important because that's a lot of what we're talking about today and has been talked about today. But all the others are important as well. And then you drop down to ecosystem services and valuation of natural assets. Well, that's fundamental because unless you can actually demonstrate that the work you're doing is providing value back to the community, why would you do it? So anyway, so this is, what we re this is one of the things I really wanted to see come out of this. I want to see a nice, simple, someone used the term infographic today, and I think it's a good term. Something you can sit down, it takes a whole big complex picture with lots of different aspects and ingredients, including time, and says, right, this is where we are today. This is our toolbox. Um, here are the people that are going to partner with us. Here are the people we're going to look to for co-funding. And these are, these are sorts of things that we need to do to get to our long-term objectives up here. Now, that's a wonderful Mark I version, but to me, 
if I was trying to go from here to Auckland, I'd be on State Highway 1 the whole time. But we actually need to know a bit more. There's, there's going to be more than one pathway to get to this destination, and we're probably going to have to use more than one pathway from time to time. We've got to be prepared to change around. But anyway, we have an implementation plan, and that's great. And there's some really good solid stuff in there. Um, but most of all, I think what this what this this, this report, if you like, this plan gives is a framework. Call it a governance framework. It's owned effectively by regional councils. It's going to be driven by the buyer managers, and it's going to follow a certain set of protocols. It's going to go through certain cyclic sort of stages from milestones. So it's there, hopefully, to stay, and um, that's what we have. Now, we've made some quite good progress. It's still very early days, I might say, but as particularly the, the, the bioheritage challenge moves along, we're starting to see the germs of some ideas that are turning up now, some projects that regional councils buy into in different measures uh, and for different reasons. But all those ideas that, that are popped up there, some of which are going to have already started, some of which are on the way, are stuff that we can tap into. This one here looks really interesting because it fits into the sort of work that is happening um, at the Cape to City. And I think this is a real blueprint for other regional councils. So we really need to get on and, in, and, and support and invest uh, research that's going to underpin and take that stuff forward. But also, it's really important now, I think regional councils are recognised as a key research user group. We're part of the game, and we're prepared and positioned to collaborate, partner, and dare I say it, regional councils might even chuck some money in the pot. So, yep, well, as I say, we've got a, we've been with, we've had our roadmap for about three years now. And the environment changes. I mean, for example, there's big things happen. We've got the Biohazard Challenge, we've got stuff that's happening in MB, we've got Predator to Feed 2050. There's all sorts of stuff happening that this roadmap needs to adapt around and change. Regional councils see new issues coming along, for example, oop, Wallaby. Now, that's a lot of people say, well, so what? But a number of regional councils are seeing this as an emerging issue. How do we fit this into it? We talked a little bit about marine pests yesterday. Does that fit into it or not? For regional councils, it's got to be there. We talked a bit about ecosystem services and understanding the values of the environment that, that it provides back to us. So we've got to think about all this stuff. So here we are now. We've got a roadmap in place. You might say, right, done and dusted, done the job. But we've got to populate that roadmap. It's not just a single big state highway, one going up the middle of New Zealand. We've got to look at all the, the byways of it. In, in, very importantly, we've got to think really seriously about the intermediate outcomes. What are the steps that we need to get through? And again, I'm looking at the Cape to City project and thinking, that could, something around that's got to be an, inter, uh, an intermediate outcome for us, because how do we tap into this idea of landscape scale? Because that's the next step for us. However, um, we still need the basic tools to be able to do that, and some of the talks today have given some insight into where we're going in the future. So I just finished by saying we've started the journey, but we've still got a long way to go. Thanks, Richard. There's tons of time for questions, so you might as well fire away while Richard's up here. No questions for Richard. Um, in terms of your intermediate outcomes, mm. we're I thought you'd done a little more work on those than that. You've identified a few, I thought. Sort of, but I think we, we need to, that, that's probably a priority area. And when we review the, the roadmap, as we will, um, early next year, probably 2018, I think we need to revisit the intermediate outcomes and have a really hard look at what, what, where are we heading to, or where are the intermediate points that we're looking for. So we've done some work on it, but I still feel that um, they're not quite there yet. John. John. I hope I can hear through the PA because it's not all that good sometimes. You might have to help me a bit. Thanks, Richard. My question was just about habitat, um, and given that um, you know, a lot of the regional council is private land where habitat is sparse compared to the sort of you know the, the, the dock wildlands, is habitat creation or habitat shortage or um, sort of getting better habitat that you know, native animals like birds that might need biggish areas might use, is that any part of the regional council strategy? 
I'd like to think it, will, it is and it will be. Regional councils have just recently commissioned, or they've actually had a, a very influential report called Responsibilities for Regional Councils in Biodiversity. It's been in the pipeline for a couple of years. Now that highlights a whole lot of issues around biodiversity in, on private land that regional councils need to take account of, and clearly Habitat's got to be part of that. So I think as this document gets out there, gets into circulation, people start buying into the ideas that it's expressing, that regional councils collectively will accept that they need to do more about protecting habitat. They need to be part of that process. Again, I go back to the Cape to City project. They've taken a, a really ambitious bite of 26,000 hectares. More regional councils need to start looking at those opportunities. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yep. Okay, Ms. Fanwee. Hello, comment more than a question. I'm just going to get on my barrow about local councils in terms of our engagement in research. I mean, we do work with a lot of people in this room. We do have skin in the game in terms of funding research in this space. So just a request, I suppose, that when the next roadmap is done, if potentially it actually could drop down a level, at least in some areas, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank, thank you for that. Um, I did pick that up. Yes, I think you're right. There was a wide engagement with the original roadmap document throughout the sort of the regional council community, but I think when we come to re re review it, it would be great to have more input from different sources. No, thank you for that. Okay, well, we might move along actually. Please join me in thanking Richard and all the speakers on this session.